Hi, thanks for watching. My name's Alan. I'm going to read you a piece by Irvin Welsh that was posted on Bella Caledonia. I'll include all links below. Definitely worth a visit, filled with a lot of useful information. The piece discusses Scotland and the UK as a whole post-referendum and the current political climate that we're currently living in. Um, all very important stuff. I hope you enjoy it. Please feel free to comment afterwards and let me know what you think. Thank you and enjoy. I've lived most of my adult life in England. A fair chunk of my family in London and the black country are English. I've loved, lost, lived with, run with, betrayed, been betrayed by, done every conceivable drug and travelled to all corners of the globe with more English people than any other nationality in the world, including Scots. Yes, this is another long-winded way of making the dreaded some of my best friends are English statement, but in my case there's no way around it. My politics were formed in Scotland, but flourished in England. I'm a former Labour Party supporter, not conventionally nationalistic, but quietly proud of both my Scottish and British heritage, and saddened that the latter has been taken away from me. I mourn it regularly, especially when I return to London, which I regard almost as much as my home as my native Edinburgh. However, I've accepted that this is dearly departed and I've moved on. When I think about where my Britain went, I always stop to consider how it came about. The union of Scotland and England was a marriage of convenience between the elites of two countries in pre-democratic times. The date, 1707, provides the obvious clue that this was not an arrangement intended to further the interests of the populace of either country. Those nations were opportunistically cobbled together to facilitate imperial expansion and industrial development. Since democracy gained a foothold in the early 20th century, following on from universal suffrage and the growth of trade unionism and the Labour Party, the Union has experienced some boom periods, but there hasn't really been that much change out of two world wars, a Great Depression, several recessions and a crushing neoliberal ascendancy. One of the few decent payouts was the post-war settlement of the welfare state. This was Britain's genuine, we're all in this together period, where the elites felt that the common people perhaps deserved something back and feared what would happen if they didn't get it after building an empire, dying in the killing fields of World War I, starving in squalid slums and saving the world from Nazi tyranny. The welfare state was the deal, as well as the NHS and the eminent nationalised industries of British steel, rail and coal, there was the concept of free universal education based on ability, irrespective of social background or parental finances. The radical engine of Labour Party Clause 4 Socialism helped forge this, but it was aided by One Nation Toryism, the Butler Education Act, and old school liberalism with Beveridge and Keynes, the social and economic architects of post-war consensus. Like the elements they gave birth to, those ideological forces no longer exist, sacrificed, like their creations, on the altar of a self-serving, reductive neoliberalism. All that remains of them are the empty platitudes it's expedient for the political class leadership of all parties to rhetorically spout, half-heartedly these days, in order to convince us that factors other than greed and power lust are at work in Westminster politics. But the key is that this was more than an economic and social settlement. It provided the building blocks of a democratic, post-imperial Britishness. But that Britain has now gone. The English nationalism in all its forms has been the real powerhouse in its destruction. It long seemed to me that this force would work in tandem with the movement for Scottish independence to first dissolve and then fragment Britain as a political entity. Without the empire, and with the natural dissipation of World War II camaraderie, what was left worth saving about Britain was being systematically destroyed by the Tories with either zero or token opposition or in many cases downright complicity from Labour. When those British national assets were sold off and stripped for private gain, so much of our British national consciousness went with them. Thatcher once memorably stated, never forget that I am an English nationalist. Well yes, Scots definitely picked up on that one, but an English nationalist of a certain hue. It suits neither left-wing pro-independent Scots nor right-wing unionist Englanders to acknowledge that Thatcher and Blair, Cameron and Miliband, to a much greater degree than Salmond or the SNP, are the architects of the disintegration of Britain and the almost inevitable separation of Scotland. In the place of dead Britannia, 
Murdered on the neoliberal altar, we were offered the notion of the UK as a greater England. Or not all offered, by simple definition, there is realistically no place for the Scots, Welsh or Northern Irish at this table. This was a worldview dominated by the Tory shires, its epicentre, the affluent southeast. Let's be clear, Britain might have been dismembered, but the UK is not broken. This reactionary, imperialist residue of the British welfare state is functioning perfectly as a mechanism to transfer the resources of this country to a small, transnational cabal of super-rich. While all this was happening, the culture was responding. The Union Jack was being phased out all over England by the St George's Cross as the nationalistic emblem of choice. It wasn't just football that was coming home in England, it was the absence of the unifying post-war British institutions of the welfare state, it was English nationalism. The 90s Cool Britannia era, where pop stars decked their guitars, coats and dresses in the Union flag, was Blairism's surface retro attempt to compensate for the fact that the punters on both sides of the border were fleeing back to their old saints. Europe's turbulent modern history of imperialism and fascism ensure that nationalism is a term loaded with negative connotations. Yet the ideology of any nation-state can be based on inclusivity or exceptionalism. It can be about meeting the wishes of its citizenry in a modern democracy or overly mindful of a status it achieved during imperialism and colonialism. Scottish nationalism has made its choice arguably definitively during the independence referendum. It's always unwise to generalise from your own experiences, but here are a couple of self-indulgent anecdotes from last September. When I was out in Edinburgh campaigning, some people asked me to be photographed with the St Andrew's Cross. I was happy to be in pictures, but refused to have them taken with the flag. I explained that I just wasn't a banners person of either the Scottish or the British variety. A few people were bemused, but everyone, to a man and woman, even in the heat of the moment when Scotland was on the verge of voting to end the Union, listened intently to what I had to say and respected my viewpoint. This brought home to me that the country, with all the usual caveats and exceptions, have grabbed with both hands the opportunity the campaign afforded it to grow from being the least to the most politically mature part of the UK. My second anecdote provides a contrast. When it looked like the Union was sliding away, a nervous English friend said to me, If you become independent, Scots and England will be treated like Poles and Romanians. This begged the obvious question, how are Poles and Romanians treated in England? The answer is, of course, the same way as in Scotland or in any other host nation, like human beings by human beings, and something less than human by bigoted arseholes. My friend is a good guy. He'll stay nameless, as it was an out-of-character comment that didn't do him justice. Yet the shrill and snide elements of heart, fear and exasperation it contains have been regurgitated as a staple fare by the mainstream private media, the Conservative Party and often shockingly the Labour Party. Scottish independence is never going to be well received in the populous South East. The weight of history, custom and practice makes it hard for people there to look at the basic simple structure of unitary centralised government with the location of all its main institutions in London and accept that the remainder of the UK subsidises all of this and therefore that region. Everything from the great cultural, sporting and vanity projects and tourist attractions to the overheated housing market is explained at its heart by that governmental subsidy the rest of the UK gives to the South East. From a standpoint of UK unity, this only became problematic in recent times. It wasn't so important in an industrial era as the factories, mills, mines and docks lay largely in the North, Midlands, Scotland and Wales. The class war zeal of Thatcherism turned what was always going to be an inevitable and painful deindustrialisation of the British economy into a festival of exploitation and hate. The neoliberal template was set, since then accelerated with the austerity scam to exacerbate the regional power and wealth imbalance to the extent of undermining the viability of the UK as a state. Theoretically, this could have been fixed, perhaps through the reform of government on a federal basis. However, there is no will or leverage to do this in a nation where the wealthiest region holds the balance of power. It suits the Conservatives to have become a regional party, insofar as the South is the most populous and dominant one, and it has led to a different type of politics developing there. Greater economic activity leads to an influx of people with subsequent competition for housing, schools and services. Therefore, there are opportunities for racist politics based on the Trojan horse of limiting immigration, accompanied by the seductive, if silly, Paradise Lost ballad so beloved of the right. 
This is the essence of the Greater England project sometimes sold when it cares enough to remember, as in the referendum, as a sham Britishness. The English right-wing establishment's current demonisation of Scots, who remember, actually voted no to separation, is largely about an attempt to define English national identity on their own divisive terms. It's now very little to do with Scotland. For many, that country seems to have become a mere tool in a covert battle for the soul of Englishness. Of course, it's also the narrative of simpletons. Anything that inverts cause and effect generally is. If you believe that the previously harmonious and prosperous UK is being derailed and undermined by Scottish malcontents, then you're either an irredeemable idiot or, at best, chronically out of touch with historical reality.